You are listening to Megiddo Radio. Megiddo Radio is a radio ministry of Megiddo Films. For more, visit our website at www.megiddofilms.org. Good everybody, welcome. This is Paul Flynn with Megiddo Radio for the 9th of May, 2016. On tonight's show, we're going to be talking about the political process and what I see as political pragmatism invading the church. It's not new, what I'm going to be talking about tonight. But I just want to go through a few more examples of it that some listeners have been sending toward uh, in my general direction. A number of years ago, I did an, a series of shows on the then pastor of First Baptist Church of Hammond, Indiana, Jack Scopp, who's now serving a prison sentence because of, um, I don't know how, how you describe it, kind of an underage sexual relationship with an underage girl under the age of 16, I think. This is back in 2012 when I did this. This is big news at the time. First Baptist Church of Hammond, Indiana is a massive institution uh, known really through the rabid fundamentalism of people like Jack Hiles and then his predecessor, who is his son-in-law. After Jack Hiles passed away, Jack Scopp took over. And there... After the after Jack Scop left First Baptist Church of Hammond, Indiana, everything seemed to be okay. And it seemed, I mean, this is back when I was leaving fundamentalism. I was studying things and finding problems with dispensationalism. And I, I was gradually agreeing more and more with the doctrines of grace. This is back in 2012. By the end of 2012, I was a full five-point Calvinist and having serious questions about dispensationalism, but wanted to be gradual about it, take my time with it. I didn't want to throw out everything. And it took me a while. I think the most important thing with the doctrines of grace, because it's how you understand the gospel, is salvation in the hands of man or in the hands of God. And that is massively important, whether you agree with somebody historically like Charles Finney, who believed that salvation was the hands of man, and that revivals were the use of the right means, that you, you know, it's, and if, if there isn't a revival, it's the fault of the preacher, by and large, or, and in which case you'll bring in gimmicks and all this other stuff, and you'll bring the schmaltzy music, and you'll sing, Have Thine Own Way, Lord, over and over and over again in order to emotionally manipulate them, in order to going forward in an altar call, and then they see that as a salvation experience. I've gone through it before in the show, number of shows, one show that comes to mind, Charismatic Movement, uh, was it Charismatic Hypnotists, and, and Psychological Manipulators. Uh, it's a bit of a long title, a bit of a mouthful. But today I want to talk about the political pragmatism. I don't have a have a problem with people having or pastors having political opinions. I think it's kind of strange if you don't. I mean, the Bible talks about state government. This is not like flying a plane. The, I, I heard analogies like, oh, well, it's just like flying a plane or being CEO of a company. No, you need to be moral as well in these things. There's a moral compass involved you know you don't crash the plane you don't do anything that might cause danger to the passengers if you're the ceo well you've got to obey god you know don't defraud anybody so but at the same time it's not the same thing the sword has not been given to a ceo of a corporation and the sword has not been given to the pilot but the sword of that part of the vengeance of God, talked to, it's talked about in Romans 13, is given to the state magistrate. It is given to the state. They are ministers of God, whether they, whether they hate God or not. They are servants of God. They will be held accountable if you are a politician. 
listening to this, you and you do not believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, and you are still naked in your own filthy rags before the Father, and you have not been clothed in, and you have not been washed clean by the blood of the Lamb, if you do not have that sweet union communion with Christ, there's greater condemnation upon you because of the responsibilities given to you. Woe on that day if you are not clothed in the perfect righteousness of Christ. You're, it doesn't matter what philanthropic work you may have claimed to have done. It doesn't matter unless you are in Jesus Christ. It will all be burnt up. It will all count for nothing. Your greatest deeds are but filthy rags. Now, what I mean by the title of the show is Political Pragmatism, Invading the Church, Taking Over the Church, whatever you want to call it. I have a number of clips. I was talking about First Baptist Church there a minute ago in Hammond, Indiana, and they had a change in pastor a couple of years ago. And it seems like he's a much more amiable guy. He seems like a nice person in comparison with Jack Scop, who honestly came across as... I don't know how to say this in a nice way. He came across as a pervert. There are a number of sermons in which Jack Scott was preaching. He looked like he looked like a he looked like a predator, and I felt like this before. This is uh, this this is not me in hindsight. I was a number of years ago. I was about to go to. I'm not going to mention the college's name, but I was about probably a couple of weeks away from attending it. it the college in the United States. This is back ooh, 2012. And I, I thank God I am, I, you know, that I didn't go there. I hope in the future I get to go to a seminary, but it's not the right place. And I, I thank God that the Lord closed that door. But at the time, I was very close to going. And I know I, I've been doing research in Jack Scott. I see I saw a lot of problems and the heresies he was teaching <clears throat> and the kind of really perverted things he was saying at times. And then this close relationship with this said church and college that had just almost started very <clears throat> recent. And I said, I cannot in good conscience join with this institution. It was so wicked. I'm not just saying, look, all churches have problems. You can't just abandon them over every single little thing. But I said, there's huge problems here. This guy is a heretic. He's dangerous. Uh, he's involved in the emerging church. You know, this Pastor G, and I think he's in Hammond as well, but they're closely associated. They, I couldn't in good conscience go. But, So this is what, late, maybe it was 2013, I can't remember the dates anyway, but a few months later, I, and I sent emails to anybody in this college that I could get my hands on, and I said, here's why I'm not going. <coughs> and Sorry, I'm coughing a lot today. And I got one response from one person in the faculty, fairly high up, who gave me a very... Well, we not exactly in these words, but you know, us independent Baptists, we we have to stick together, kind of thing. As in, it doesn't matter what you're teaching; we just have to stay together. He just ignored. I sent him link after link after link, and I know you shouldn't respond to every single internet rumor, but this is material that if you were in any, at least that I'm aware of, any Presbyterian denomination. Orthodox, I'm talking about an Orthodox denomination. I'm not talking about PCUSA. I'm not talking about the Church of Scotland. I'm talking about Orthodox, godly denominations. You would be brought before some kind of a hearing. Sometimes some of the stuff that ends up before the the Presbyterian courts can be quite trivial at times, and but it gets heard. But there's nothing like that in independency. It's just, ah, well, it doesn't matter. We'll just stay together. We need unity. Because the sad thing with independent Baptists is they're either, there's, there's, and they swing back in pendulums. They're either tearing each other apart or accepting 
the worst, grossest errors because they're so tired of fighting each other. One of the main reasons neo-evangelicalism, and I dealt with that in my film of Chaos and Confusion a number of years ago, this, that's back in 2012, it talks a little bit about fundamentalism. And in, in the movie, I didn't know how I felt about it at the time. And I think I kind of conveyed that. I wasn't really for or against it. But the whole thing that I noticed studying through history was you had the first generation fundamentalists who, you know, we believe in the deity Christ, we believe in the virgin birth. And it was just a kind of a boiling down to just not around the gospel, but around these. Oh, yes, we have to agree in these things, but there's more. How about the creeds, which are in much greater detail? What the fundamentalist movement said, well, the Armenian Calvinist thing, that doesn't really matter anymore. Probably why J. Gershom Machen didn't want to be called a fundamentalist, but I digress. So, but then it was second generation, the children of that first generation fundamentalists who by and large became neo-evangelicals. They didn't like that harsh separation and they ended up kind of just throwing it off completely there's a, there is biblical separation by the way but it's it's from unbelief it is not as some of these churches are sadly oh well, we don't believe in pre-tribulation rapture you can't become a member don't believe in the pre-tribulation rapture we can't support you anymore it's no longer about the gospel oh and it's just so sad when this happens Dispensationalism has done nothing in the church in the last 200 years but split it apart and cause schism after schism after schism. Along with Arminianism, because people have different degrees of how close you can get to liberalism, because Arminianism is a road to Rome, and I've done a show on that, explaining why. So did the Council of Trent, it's synergistic. And it's also a road to liberalism. I am not saying now that Arminians are liberals. No. But it is a road. And it's why you notice in so many fundamentalist homes, and look, I know you're going to say it happens in Reformed homes as well because the truth is not taught often. Because Reformed parents are leaving their children in Arminian schools and thinking that's okay. It's not okay. We're supposed to raise them in education and educate them in the truth, not in a free will heresy that the the Church of Rome advanced and pushed to the Counter Reformation. Part of the part of the success of the Reformation was refuting the idol and slaying the idol of free will. The man is not dead in trespasses and sins, he's just sick which has led to all these gimmicks and all these other things and the problems that happen because there's no clear line on who to fellowship with anymore. This is not just a problem. I'm going to play a clip in a while, in a little bit, from First Baptist Church of Hammond, Indiana. They had Raphael Cruz over. I'm not going to play all of the clip. Raphael Cruz is the father of Ted Cruz, the Texas senator who, all intents and purposes, people don't seem to, well, he doesn't seem to be able to prove, just like Obama did, that he's a, he's a, he's definitely a natural born citizen, but I digress, we won't get into that here. The, I'm not going to talk about Ted Cruz really, I, I might talk about the political results in a little bit, if we get time. But Rafael Cruz is a charismatic. He's a charismatic pastor. He's a dominionist pastor. He teaches the seven mountains of dominionism heresy. This is not to be confused with post-millennialism. Just really quickly, the seven mountains, and I've done this in another show about Rafael Cruz. He teaches, not just him, but this goes back to, I think Francis Schaeffer and a couple of other ones back in the... <clears throat> back in the 70s and the 80s, where they believe that they need to take over media and sci uh, education, these seven different mountains of culture anyway, one of them is the government, 
very much a top-down approach, rather than biblical, Puritan, post-millennialism, which is out- outlined excellently, actually, in Murray's book, uh, The Puritan Hope, which I would recommend people read, even if you're not a post-millennial persuasion, if you're all millennial persuasion, look at the beliefs of people like William Carey, Jonathan Edwards. They believed in revivals were going to come in the future. But they didn't need to bring in gimmicks because they didn't believe in free will. They didn't believe it was of the will of the flesh or the will of man, but of the will of God. And in such an understanding of Scripture, you do not bow down to the will of man. The the political pragmatism. I'm jumping around a lot here today. But there's a number of things I want to talk about. The political pragmatism is, at the moment you've got Donald Trump. Donald Trump is not pro-life. He's not a Christian. I've done, dealt with that in the vlog. He hasn't gone to God for forgiveness. He actually says that. Do, do not tell me, oh, that's between him and God. Yes, it is between him and God. But we know he's not a Christian because he says he hasn't gone to God for forgiveness. He told us that. And he also, he's not, like, he's better on abortion than Hillary Clinton. I don't want to come here and say that Hillary Clinton and Donald Trump are as bad as each other. Don't follow the media narrative. Donald Trump is not as bad as Hillary Clinton. Donald Trump is better in the economy and things like that. But anyway, is that hard? Could that be hard? I digress. I don't... Ted Cruz... I do not approve of much of the behavior of Ted Cruz during this campaign. And... A lot of people... For example, the, the, the Paul campaign... From what I remember, when he became the senator... Texas senator back in 2012... The, the Paul campaign were very much behind... That's Ron Paul, Rand Paul... Very much a libertarian movement. It was very much behind Ted Cruz. But then Ron Paul just basically said, he's owned by Goldman Sachs. Which is true. He's establishment. There's a long list of reasons why I don't like Ted Cruz either. Again, I'm not an American. Here's what I'm going to say, right? I think Christians would be better served rather than ripping each other apart, yes, it's important who's in the government. Absolutely. I'm not saying it's not important. But to be better served putting your efforts into something biblical. Campaigning for Cruz. Oh, no. Cruz is gone now. Campaigning for whoever it is who does not bow the knee to God. Now, you might say, well, well Ted Cruz claims to be a Christian. His father, Raphael Cruz... And this is not hard to find out about. It's not like hidden or anything. This is just do a quick Google search or YouTube search. And there's video after video of Rafael Cruz, who Ted Cruz says is his hero. His words. He says, my dad is my hero. So he doesn't claim any kind of. So what does what does Rafael Cruz believe? Rafael Cruz, and I've done this in other shows, so I'm not going to play the clip here. But Raphael Cruz believes that the U.S. Constitution is divinely inspired of God, just like the Mormon Church. And plenty of Christians, rightly so, had a problem with voting for somebody like Mitt Romney. But political pragmatism came in and said, oh, well, we can't vote for the Democrat, Barack Obama, because he's worse, the lesser of two evils. They don't say the lesser of two evils, because if you realize it's the lesser of two evils... It's sin. It's still evil. You know, could you imagine if Hitler or Stalin are before you? And again, I am not saying that Donald Trump is Hitler or any kind of nonsense like that. I think those... I think a lot of the stuff that's hurled against Donald Trump, to be honest, is nonsense. A lot of it's false. Does he stick with the same positions? No. He's weak in a lot of different things. But I think the candidates are so bad and so bought out by Goldman Sachs and the, the New York Wall Street banks and massive 
corporations because there's very much crony capitalism there. Not true capitalism, but crony capitalism. That's what we should point out. Has very much bought the election. So, sadly, Trump is the best of a bad bunch. And I don't like Trump. I wouldn't vote for any of them if I was there in the United States right now. But who should we vote for if we're Christians? I mean, it's not just the person who's, oh, well, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm pro-life and all this kind of stuff. What we've said about the first table of law, that doesn't matter. They don't need to be Christians. They don't need to bow the knee to Yahweh God. And what's happening now in places across the world that claim to be Christian, none of the table counts anymore. Either the whole thing counts or none of it counts. This Anabaptist not notion that the first table of the law, the first four commandments, doesn't matter. The for you know, like that all religions are the same if you get rid of the first commandment. It doesn't matter how you worship God. There's no promotion of the true religion, second commandment. Third commandment, your reverence and how the nation is towards God doesn't matter. If you're saying that God doesn't matter, because the first table of law is how we approach God. And this political pragmatism puts that aside and says, well, you know what? We can all agree, the liberals and everybody else, we can agree, well, murder's wrong. Can we all agree on that? Well, they don't all agree on that. Because they suppress the truth and the righteousness, and they believe in murdering a tiny child in the womb. They believe in murder. They believe murder, in certain instances, is okay. Based on what? Based, based on, well, that's not living. That's not, that's not life. You need to enjoy life. You need to have a certain standard of living. Otherwise, your life isn't worth anything. That's why they can say, well, if you're in a hospital bed and you're 70 years old and you're not doing anything, well, you know, what's the point? To just kill the person if they're in a bit of pain. Human life is not valued. Men are not seen in the image of God. And when you allow more sin in, it begets more sin. If you concede ground to the enemy by surrendering in the state the first table of the law, all of the law will go. It doesn't work. It doesn't happen. And sadly, we have adopted an Anabaptist view of church church government. And I know the, the Anabaptists get a kind of a rosy picture. The Anabaptists never really didn't agree with each other. There was many, many movements called Anabaptist. And all they knew, <coughs> what they would do really is, well, we disagree with Rome, and often they would go the complete opposite way. Michael Servetus, for example, who rejected the Trinity, based upon, well, Rome taught it, so I'm not a Trinitarian. Oh, that's a Romanist heresy. You still hear people make those same arguments today. And some were communists, some were violent revolutionaries. Some were, it seems, godly Christians at times. But they were thorns on the side of the progress of the Reformation. They were divisive. It's really, truly sad what happened with them. They were reactionaries. And they had all their view of what was supposed to be done, etc. and so on. But that is the view that's been taken on. A kind of a revolutionary, reactionary view. If the error is there, well, I'm just going to do the complete opposite. That is more dangerous at times than the error itself. Well, hit. I was going to say Hitler. <laughs> Freudian slip. Hillary Clinton, she doesn't believe in any kind of restriction for abortion. No, she uses political whatever. So we need to get behind Trump. Well, Trump believes if you're raped, well, you can have an abortion. If you... If it was incest. Incest, sorry. You can have an abortion. He has these different things. You see, this is why conservative... It means nothing... And it hasn't meant anything for for ages. Look, Ted Cruz would not have been your savior either. Ted Cruz was 
His wife was on the Council of Foreign Relations, a globalist organization undermining the sovereignty, the national sovereignty of the United States of America. I mean, <laughs> everything Ted Cruz claims to represent, his wife was representing the complete opposite. Talking about a North American community, North American Union, all these kind of things. So don't try and make out that Christians do research. Just don't just listen to Fox and all the media outlets. Okay, look at all of them, but compare them. And if you don't know, you don't know, fine. Ah, <sighs> But it's, I digress. In, in Northern Ireland, sadly, there seems to be, from what I can see in a number of different churches, an unwillingness. I don't like what happened, what's kind of happened over the last couple of decades with a lot of free Presbyterians who are both in government, famous example, Ian Paisley, um, in government, and in state government and in church government. That's a conflict of interest. They are separate spheres. You're either in one or the other. It's not that a Christian can't serve in government. Of course they can. But you can't serve in both. I mean, you can be advantageous. The, the, the state should keep the church in line by promoting true religion. The state should preach against, or the church should see, preach against any sin that's done by the state. So they should almost like, in, in a, you know, for want of a better way of saying it, a checks and balances. They're separate, but one's not above the other. If you have the state above the church, or you have a Rastianism, kind of like Church of England, and if you have the, ch the church above the state, then you have Roman Catholicism. They're both errors. The state and the church, they're separate, but this is not saying that the state can be godless. And just allow whatever it wants. Well, if you're allowing whatever you want and any religion to do whatever they want, don't be surprised when they start murdering babies in your country and calling it women's rights. That's what political pragmatism. I'm not saying that the church should stay silent. The church shouldn't stay silent. The church should speak out where the Bible says... It's not to be a party political broadcast or anything like that, which sadly some churches have become. But where the Bible has answers towards a certain issue, for example, in our church last, uh, when was it, about two weeks ago, I think it was, our minister, David Silverside, he preached, sides preached on, should we, you know, he's talking about Britain, be in the European Union. And it's talking about the Brexit vote that's coming up in June, and I'll try and do a show on that, actually, maybe in a couple of weeks' time. And he gave biblical reasons, biblical reasons from the scriptures to leave. That's what we need. But biblical pragmatism has replaced the Bible with the so-called wisdom of men. It has happened in Northern Ireland, in various... I'm not saying all the Free Presbyterian churches are terrible up in Northern Ireland or anything like that, but there is undoubtedly... If you're from Northern Ireland and you've seen it, you know yourself that there has been kind of like decisions made by ministers of the gospel in church government that they would be disciplined for if they did the same thing in their church. I did a vlog there a couple of months ago. I think it was, I think the guy's name was Marvin Story. And he is both a minister in the Northern Ireland Assembly and he's also a, a, a ruling elder in a congregation in Northern Ireland. And he approved of and supported a grant, I think it was a couple of thousand pounds, towards an LGBT blasphemous play that depicted Jesus as a transgender woman. You can't make this stuff up. Now, I don't know. I haven't followed up, the, followed up in the story. I have not heard uh, one of the listeners. I've never actually met him in person. I'd love to meet him at some stage. But has emailed me about it and things like that. And, you know, if you're listening now, you probably know I'm talking about you. But I, I have not heard that he has been disciplined or anything like that. 
He should be disciplined. This is like a no-brainer. But we've said that the, it doesn't matter as long as we preserve freedom of religion. As long as the church has kind of got just leave us alone and we'll worship God. Rather than preaching the gospel, we've tried to strike deals at times with the devil. And we've encroached, we've retreated, retreated, retreated. We should support only candidates who bow the knee to our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Because without, without being regenerated, they don't care about the law of God. Donald Trump and Hillary Clinton, believe this or not, are both professing Christians. Hillary Clinton attends, I think it's the United Methodist Church. And regardless of how many stories of her sordid life and the Clintons' life is true, they're professing Christians. But they don't love the Word of God unless their hearts have been changed. They can't. They hate God's truth. They hold the truth in a righteousness. <laughs> you know, again, the solution was not, okay, let's not let Trump in, let's get Marco Rubio, or let's get Ted Cruz. And I sadly think that that's what a lot of people seem to think. Oh, he'd be much better, yeah, but lesser of two evils. Although Rubio is establishment and Cruz is establishment, as much as he claims not to be, but... I don't want to get into an argument about that. That's not my major point. <clears throat> Americans are so desperate to believe that one of their political leaders is actually a Christian that they will grab onto any profession of faith, regardless of how flimsy it is. Now, granted, Ted Cruz's is probably the clearest, and I actually thought for a while, okay, probably he's a Christian. Then I researched him more, and I got, nah, I have a lot of doubts. And he's... He's not known for telling the truth a lot. It's just a fact. He isn't. To quote Carly Fiorina, who he chose as his vice presidential nomination, nominee, sorry, they're out of it now. It was a silly choice, but she said months ago during the campaign, Cruz is a typical politician. He will say whatever... To, he'll say one thing to one group, one thing to another group. That's not Christ-like behavior. I said, we're not electing a pastor-in-chief. You're electing a minister of God. It says in Romans 13. And you'll be held responsible for that. I say, oh, well, if we don't vote, well, Hillary will get in. Well, if you do vote, maybe Trump will get in or whoever else. Do they love God? Do they love God? Why do we constantly settle for political pragmatism and try to buddy buddy up with churches or not churches, buddy buddy up with politicians who do not we should urge them to do the right thing. Of course, at every opportunity, we should letter them about defending a uh, and I've done this about defending a uh, again Ch children in the womb against murder, against abortion. But voting for them and putting your hand of approval upon them? No. How can you prove and pick somebody who does not bow the knee to God? They cannot serve God. They cannot be faithful ministers of God. They will not kiss the sun, as the end of Psalm chapter 2 talks about. And you might say, well, who else takes this position? Historically, it was called covenanting. The Covenanters who came mainly out of Scotland and the high point of the United Kingdom and the Reformation there was called the Solemn League and Covenant of 1643. And that gradually slipped away. In There was the Revolution Settlement of 1688. There was many things biblical in there, but not everything. But you have... Historically, now, the Reformed Presbyterians were not where we were 
I think anybody who's studied the history in the past, we're not where we were. I'm a Reformed Presbyterian. I'm still studying about the history of the denomination. It started in Scotland, and there's a, there's a Reformed Presbyterian Church of Ireland, which I'm part of. And, and there's also Reformed Presbyterian Church in the sister churches in North America and other places around the world. Historically, at least, I don't know if every one of them, so you know, will be on the principle of covenanting. And what I mean by that is, we need the nation needs to bow the knee and agree to follow God. Its political leaders need to follow God, and anything below that, okay, they'll make mistakes and they won't be perfect, just like your pastors. But at least you believe your pastor is saved, right? Well, and then he loves God, otherwise he should never have been in that position in the first place. But he must love God as well. The politician must love God. That's the biblical requirements placed upon it. And any kind of political pragmatism. Oh, well, it's only the second table. Why the second table? Why not the whole law of God? Why is it okay for a business to open on Sunday? when it's the Lord's day, and it's a violation of the fourth commandment. Unless it's like a hospital or maybe a factory that has to stay open because if it shut its doors, well, it wouldn't be able to reopen again for... But they have a skeleton crew on a Sunday. I'm not talking about works of necessity and mercy. Works of necessity and mercy are allowed on the Lord's day. If you're a doctor, well, you know, people don't choose when and how to get sick, you know. Uh... A friend of mine, he's a doctor, and some, some Lord's Days he misses. But that's a work of necessity, a work of mercy. We're not getting legalistic here, but these things are, are described in the Word of God. But is it okay that a business can just open up on the Lord's Day? If you're a libertarian, and, for example, right, in the United Kingdom, I'm not in, I don't live in the United Kingdom, I live very close to the United Kingdom, I live like 15 minutes drive away from the border in the Republic of Ireland, there's a group called UKIP. And I agree with a lot of things UKIP say. However, they're, you know, fairly libertarian. Similar in a lot of ways to, like, say, Ron Paul and things like that. But because they're libertarian, I don't think, I don't know if they actually use the term libertarian, but they are libertarian. And they don't really say, oh, we're a Christian party. There's Christians in the party, and some I've got a huge amount of respect for, and I love, and they, I think they're wonderful people. However, there's no clear that you're just defending religious freedom. You're just saying, well, every religion is the same. Only the second table law seems to matter. It's a, how would I put it? It's more political pragmatism, I'm afraid. Political pragmatism is not always horrible people over on the other end making terrible deals. The reason they got to that point where they made that terrible deal is they compromised. And then they compromised a little bit more. And then they kept compromising. And they got their hearts got harder and harder. And they justified it to themselves. And they, every man did that which was right in his own eyes. How are we going to serve God? But in the political process, it's not just, you know, oh, well, he's an anti-abortion candidate. Seriously, that's the requirement? That he has to be against murder? That's not what the Bible says. It woefully falls short. And going back to the covenant obligations that Britain and Ireland has... Going back to 1643, we have it anyway, but it's even more condemnation upon these islands. We agreed in covenant <coughs> to uphold and promote the government, to promote the, ref the, the religion of the Church of Scotland, which is the Reformed religion otherwise expressed in the Westminster Standards. Nothing less than that. Otherwise, you're promoting evil. Do you think God can bless that? You bless 
our rebellion, of course, God will work with or without us and things like that. But you don't see revival in a vacuum. You see God using men, changing their hearts, driving them to their knees, crying out to revival. And so that when revival comes, God gets the glory because it's in the midst of good theology. It's in the midst of men who don't constantly talk about themselves. Sadly, the the internet is replete with ministers and radio shows who just they just talk about themselves. And they spend time refuting articles that were against themselves. Most of the time, if anything's written on the internet about me, I should ignore it and just move on. Now, every now and again, it makes sense to maybe reply and just clarify a few things. But we're not here to defend ourselves. We're not here to defend religious liberty. The glory of God. Solo Deo Gloria. A candidate that does not bow the knee to Christ, you're saying, and if you're saying that's the solution, that will make, you know, like with the Donald Trump, that will make America great again. <sighs> he won't. Because you're not acknowledging the reason why America was, whatever great, whatever you want to call it, was there were so many Christians who loved God. If you want to make a city on a hill again, that that's referring to scripture. That there's saved Christians in the land. It needs revival. Donald Trump doesn't even know the first thing about the gospel. If you're saying that he's the answer, then you're saying God is not the answer. What a frightful thing to say. Okay, finally, we're going to get to this clip. Rafael Cruz, this is a couple of weeks ago. Still, when he's... Son was still in the campaign. This is in Indiana. And Tate Cruz was heavily beaten. Again, I have a problem with them. This is a church seen in the fundamentalist world as some kind of bastion of wonderfulness or whatever. You know, when they, ha they installed their new pastor a couple of years ago after the Jack Scott scandal. There was all these independent Baptist churches lauding them of how wonderful they were. I played on a radio show a number of years ago. I'm probably about three or four years old now. They had not repented. They just made it sound like it was a blip. But Jack Hiles, and they're just running some kind of a cult, personality cult. Let's just play this clip, and we'll comment on it. Well, when ask the ushers, if there's anybody in the foyer that'd like to come in, let, please usher them in, if you would, please. Before we take our offering, I want to introduce to you uh, Rafael Cruz and Brother uh, Mr. Cruz. If you'll come, if you would, please. Had the joy this afternoon to uh, to meet uh, Mr. Cruz, and he is uh, has a great testimony of what God did in his life, and I want him to share that with us, if we can, for a few moments. I've asked him to take about ten to fifteen minutes to address us and. He is the father of Ted Cruz, who is our uh, president candidate uh, for the president of the United States, and, uh, but a man who obviously loves the Lord Jesus Christ, and I've enjoyed hearing of his testimony and knowing uh, about his heart. Seriously, the sermon level is about up there as much as Michael Brown's. He obviously loves the Lord Jesus Christ. Again, this is a problem within fundamentalism. Oh, well, he just says he loves God, and that's it. That's enough. If you don't know enough about a person, don't put him in the pulpit. If you put somebody in the pulpit, you're saying, I trust this person, I know this person, and they are sound theologically. This guy's a charismatic heretic who believes that the U.S. Constitution was given by inspiration of God, a doctrine also taught by the Church of, Latin, the, the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, also known as the Mormon cult, or the Mormon Church. And they're... I don't want to get into all the Cruz campaign, but this is more political pragmatism. And I've played clips about Rafael Cruz before. 
The next clip I want to play, this is from a couple of years ago, showing, again, these are examples. I was going to do a vlog on this, just about First Baptist Church of Hammond, Indiana, but then I said, okay, maybe I can talk about political pragmatism, because this happens all over the place. This happens all over the place. I mean, Liberty University, at the end of last year, had Bernie Sanders speaking. Kind of a convocation. Bernie Sanders, the communist symp sympathizer, <coughs> who is pro abortion as about as pro abortion as you can imagine. And there's a clip of Liberty University, this great university everybody thinks is so great. And Jerry Falwell Jr., the son of the late Jerry Falwell, believes that Donald Trump is a Christian. Wow. The discernment level is amazing. All right, up there with Jack Scop, who believed that Barack Obama is a Christian. Political pragmatism. It's not pragmatic at all. It doesn't work. It may appear to work short term. It's a bit like when Moses was told to speak to the rock, and rather than speaking to the rock, he strikes the rock in frustration and anger. And the same result came out both times. The water gushes out of the rock, but he disobeys God, and he faces the consequences. Pragmatism, in that sense, you know, like you try something out and it works this first time, and then you try, you know, by experience, is not biblical. It's not biblical. And when you apply it to politics, which... Sadly, the majority of the Christian church does this to politics all the time. Very rarely do we not do we stop and say, I'm not voting for an evil, an evil, wicked candidate who is not completely, you know, like a pro-abortion candidate. There's two of them for the United States. I mean, I don't think everything said about Donald Trump is true. I am one of the few people actually thinks. What you see is what you get with Donald Trump. Ted Cruz is a complete fraud. Marco Rubio is an establishment bought and paid for. The Democrats are the Democrats. Pfft. I think any Christian should know that the Democrats are so vehemently anti-God, it doesn't take much explaining. But apparently it does. Back in 2013, Peter... Wisklowski, a Roman Catholic congressman, was invited to the pulpit to speak for a few minutes. And he is a representative in the, con uh, in the Congress in, for, you know, the state of Indiana. And let's listen to the introduction he's given. Does it sound like First Baptist Church of Hammond, Indiana has changed or has done anything or is not as pragmatist or everything else? Essentially, no. The erasmataz and some of that thing seems to have gone away, I think. It's been toned down. But essentially, the theology stays the same, so not much changes. We're honored today have with us our Congressman Pete Wisklowski. And I'll ask him if you make his way to the platform just a moment, if you would, please, Congressman. Uh, also with him today is Tom Cuban, and I would appreciate so much your presence today as well. When I became your pastor, just a few days after that, uh, the congressman took time to come to my office and uh, for no other purpose or no other agenda, just to meet and find out uh, what uh, he can do to be an encouragement to us. I'm very grateful for him. I had the opportunity to be with him in his office there in Washington, D.C. on Tuesday, and he was very gracious to give us time and attention, listen, and we had a word of prayer together. He is a longtime congressman. and uh, we, had a, we had a word of prayer together? <laughs> you know what I mean? Do you not know he's a Roman Catholic? This guy's a lost man. He doesn't know the Lord Jesus Christ. If you're going to go there, witness to him. I'm not saying not go there. Go witness to him. Don't invite him to the pulpit like he's your friend or fellow brother in Christ. We have a word of prayer together? This guy's a Roman Catholic. And not, he's not even a conservative Roman Catholic. He's a Democrat. Uh, has a wonderful, rich history of service to her community. 
Even his father was involved in that public service arena. And I'm very honored to have him here. The Bible commands us to pray for kings and for all that are in authority that we can live a quiet and peace. That's true, but you don't invite Herod to your pulpit because Herod was wicked. If you have a wicked ruler, you preach against his wickedness, and you, look, you pray for them as well. But that does not mean you put your hand of approval upon a wicked ruler. This man here is a wicked ruler. Peaceable life with all godliness and honesty. No one can quite complicate our, our Christianity, if you will, and our opportunity to serve Jesus like the government can if they want to. And uh, one of the things I have been doing every, every week, not every single day, but I've been trying to pray for, for our elected officials in our city, here in Hammond, as well as in our, in our state houses, in our state of Indiana, and, and also in our, in our government houses there in Washington, D.C. And one of those men I've been trying to pray for and his family is here this morning with us. I'm going to ask him to take about two minutes or so and greet you today. We're delighted you're here. Thank you. Uh, Congressman Laskowski for being with us today. Now, he gives a little bit of a, a spiel for a few minutes. Um, who is this man? Okay, he's a Roman Catholic. National Cat Catholic Register put out back in 2010, they published an article, this is from their staff, which... The, the title of this article is called Meet the Catholics in Congress. Here's our snapshot, it says, of the spectrum of pro-life votes and views of Catholics in Capitol Hill, newly updated for the 120, 112th Congress. Catholics make up about 28% of the members of Congress, compared to 30%, it goes on and on. Okay, it says, following is the list of the members of the 112th Congress who refer to themselves as Catholics. Again, refer to themselves as Catholics. The percentage next to them is their pro-life rating. Pro-life rating, how much they are against murder since 1997, as compiled by the National Right to Life. Information prior to 1997 was unavailable at press time. They are listed from... Highest pro-life rating, 100%, to, well, zero. Now, it goes through the Senate. People like 100%, Mike Johans, Jim Risch, not many 100% for the Senate. Tiny percent, you know, just a minority. Then the House of Representatives... Peter, where are you, Peter? Can we find you at 100%? Viskovsky, that's his name. I'm trying to remember his name. Join John Boehner. He's got a 100% record. Who else do I recognize here? Paul Ryan, who's... A Republican, is that what, or say, yeah, Republican. He also, well, yeah, Republicans would tend to be more pro life, and Paul Ryan, 100%, according to this website. And this is published by a very prominent Roman Catholic publication. Nowhere to be seen. Maybe he's not listed. Oh, here we go 18%. 18%. So he's pro-abortion, about as pro-abortion as you can get. Nancy Pelosi, for example, is 1%. Nancy Pelosi. Are you going to have Nancy Pelosi next on the pulpit? Oh, we didn't know who he was. Do a Google search. He's a Democrat. What Democrat? I, I'm, I'm just like curious here. Is there any Democrats here? Who are pro-life? Well, Republican, Republican, Republican. And I'm not saying the Republican Party are great or anything, but at least with the Republicans, you have a chance that they're pro-life. Now, all the 100% are all Republican. Sorry, I skipped ahead there. Yeah, all the ones I can see there. All those who claim to be Roman Catholic, there's a lot of them. 
and in the Senate, all Republican. All the Democrats, and some Republicans as well, Democrat, 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 all terrible on murder. Zero percent, Peter Welsh, Democrat, Democrat, zero percent, Democrat, Linda Sanchez, Democrat from California. And here's this guy brought to this bastion of conservatism, and churches around the area seem to flock, want to help evangelize the area. This is not an institution that has slipped. This place has always been like that. It has a, had a facade for decades. Now, there are lots of churches in America and in Northern Ireland, where I live near, and I go to church there. They have a facade, but the facade is falling fast because they don't have to keep it up very much anymore. It's not necessary to keep their people. A pro-abortion Democrat The pastor of First Baptist Church of Hammond, Indiana, Pastor Wilkinson or Wilkerson, keep getting, yeah, yeah, Wilkerson, John Wilkerson, is praying with a Roman Catholic pro-murder candidate. At best, John Wilkerson has no discernment. That's the best argument you can make. And at worst, uh, let's hear the words. And it's funny how these movements that produce this kind of thing, pragmatism, largely in fundamentalism, you know, you'll get, and look, you say, oh, well, Reformed churches sometimes do this as well. Yeah, professing Reformed churches that have slipped into fundamentalism. And, you know, I'm... This ha this happens in reform circles as well. It breaks my heart. You know, you'll uh, I remember. Um, I don't need, I don't need to mention the guy's name, but there was a certain radio show host, and he's an OPC minister. Probably narrows it down too much, but anyway, who joining hands with political candidates who don't you know basically all the Republicans. And they're involved in political activism that doesn't exalt the Lord Jesus Christ. And now, all he's known for is a tirade against homosexuals, rather than just going preaching the gospel. <laughs> in the anger against what has happened in the United States of America, even last 20, 30 years, it, it doesn't start there. And if you think it's purely a political process and lack of activism, you are sadly mistaken. What America is lacking is a knowledge of the gospel. What Northern Ireland is lacking is a knowledge of the gospel. There's lots of people in Northern Ireland, you give them a tract, and they go, I'm okay. I'm a Christian. I'm a Christian so long. But they don't want to talk about God. I'm not saying that they're all false converts or anything like that. But if you're truly a Christian, you will love the Lord Jesus Christ and love to talk about him. Not necessarily talk about your testimony every five seconds. People think that that's what it is. But you will love to talk about the things of God. That's a sign that you're saved. So what, does John what did John Calvin, who was much hated in the fundamentalist movement, so the fetus talks about abortion. He's talking about abortion here, commenting on Exodus 21, 22 to 23. The fetus, though enclosed in the womb of his mother, is already a human being. And it is a monstrous crime to rob it of life, which is not yet begun to enjoy. It is, it, if it seems more horrible to kill a man in his own house than in a field, because a man's house is his place of most secure refuge, it ought surely to be deemed more atrocious to destroy a fetus in the womb before it has come to light. What a monstrous crime this is. 
May we not put our hands. May we pray, yes, for all that are in authority. Whoever wins in any part of the world, be it in the island of Ireland, in the, the British Isles, anywhere else, in the United States of America, pray for them that they will do the right thing, that they will turn to the Lord Jesus Christ, that they will have regenerate hearts. Yes, we're commanded to do that, but not to approve of them and not to create a cult of personality around them that everything they do turns to gold. This has been Paul Flynn. May God bless you all.